oh, good morning, all of you. So the, this is an interesting presentation in that there's a there's quite a bit of material science that I'll condense very quickly. So I don't want to bore all of you, and I'll try to get to the actual innovative parts and the applications. Um, so. The people who were on this invention are myself. I'm Ganesh Balakrishnan. I am the uh, director for New Mexico EBSCOR. I'm also a professor of electrical and computer engineering at UNM. I work out of the Center for High Technology Material, CHTM. Adam Hecht is uh, a, a, a faculty at, uh, at the nuclear engineering department at UNM. And another co-inventor is Dr. Erin Wan, who was our grad student on this project. She then graduated and is now a scientist at, at the Air Force Research Lab. Both uh, Adam and I are very proud of her achievements and, and much of this work is part of her thesis. Um, so this was uh, this, this particular invention, after we filed the disclosure and it was the patent was granted, we did work a bit on an LDRD uh, with the Sandia National Labs on this specific topic, which was uh, which allowed us to push this further. We also currently have Adam and I uh, have a joint NNSA Office of Learning and Career Management grant uh, with the uh, University of Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, it's on slightly different materials called perovskites, but some of the concepts that we talk about in this patent are, are overlap very well with that one. So there is active funding in the area. So this is the patent itself. Um, the, the key topic, the key innovation is we are able to grow and isolate high purity, ultra thin aluminum antimonide. And we are able to also put it on silicon. And the purpose for doing this is to achieve radiation detection. <coughs> the caveat to it is that we say dosimetry rather than active detection. And, and I will tell you the difference between the two and why we, we prefer going after dosimetry in, in slides to come. So, so some of the key innovations are that we are able to use ultra high vacuum to increase the purity of aluminum antimonide, which was holding it back in previous uh, uh, attempts at making detectors. We are also able to therefore make high resistivity aluminum antimonide. So in these detectors, you apply a strong field and if the material doesn't have high resistivity, things can break down. Uh, we are also able to fully isolate membranes and we are able to do it in a way where we protect the material from the environment, from oxygen, uh, and we call this a selective etching process. And we are also able to directly put it on silicon wafers uh, for possible CMOS uh, integrated dosimetry applications in the future. So a chip uh, where you have some primary application like a microprocessor, but it's an emission critical area. So it also is actively looking at how much radiation it is receiving. Uh, so it can warn us that it's going to imminently fail at some point. Um, so um, traditionally photons correspond to a packet of light, right? And, and when a photon hits a semiconductor, uh, it ejects an electron from what's called the valence band to the conduction band. And so you have an electron and hole pair. Now in high energy particles, um, it just bulldozes its way through the crystal, generating tons of electrons and hole pairs. Now the electrons and hole pairs find their way to the electrodes on the detector. That sets up the current and that's how we detect any signal uh, in life. So, you know, your CMOS uh, sensor in your iPhone is, is one embodiment of that concept. Um, essentially, if there is current flowing, you know, there is light. When the current shuts off, the light is gone. And the same thing applies to radiation. If there is current flowing, there is active radiation around us. And if the current shuts off, then the, the radiation doesn't exist anymore. So the the, there are some metrics that, that you look for, or parameters rather, in, in good detector material. So you want one element that is a big, chunky element, like uh, which has a high Z value is what we call it, so that when, when a particle hits, it has a higher probability of hitting that atom in the crystalline structure. Antimony has a big cross-section that way, and, and that makes aluminum antimonide a great choice. 
The other issue is you want detectors to work at room temperature. You don't want people to be carrying clunky liquid nitrogen doers into the field. Uh, it also affects the form factor because if you need that much equipment, you can't put it in, in space, you can't put it in non-proliferation applications, it becomes a problem. So wide band gap is important. There's something called um, uh, CIE or charge induction efficiency, which is critical for good charge collection. And it depends on, two, on the product of two parameters, the mobility and the carrier lifetime. So the mobility is how quickly these electrons and holes zip through the material. How fast can you collect them before you lose them? And the carrier lifetime is how long will they stay alive? So as they're zipping out of the crystal, uh, if they die before they make it to the ends, you're not going to detect the current anyway. So the, these are some of the key material parameters we look for in good detectors. The gold standard is uh, cryogenic germanium, which can be made into large chunks uh, and it works amazingly well. You can see it has very high electron mobility, very high hole mobility, stays alive for thousands of microseconds, both of them, but it only works at 77 Kelvin, which means you have to take your cryogenics everywhere you go. Cat zinc telluride has been amazing for this technology. You can make nice chunks of it. You can make detectors. Uh, electron mobility is good. Hole mobility is not that great. And likewise, the carrier mobility for the electron is not too bad, but the whole uh, lifetime is bad, uh, which means that this is not going to perform as well as germanium, but it's room temperature. And despite not performing as well as germanium, the fact that it can work at room temperature makes this a very uh, dominant technology in the field. Okay, so that's kind of what I said. So these are some of the other options. And in the very end, you see aluminum antimonide which has a lot of parameters that makes it a very promising material. It's not as good as germanium at 77, but it's significantly competitive when you compare it to the current state of the art in cat zinc telluride. So the question is, uh, so yeah, so that summarizes why aluminum antimonide is great for radiation detectors. High atomic number, wide band gap, um, dual carrier mobility is good. The problem is that Aluminum antimonide growth is difficult. And the US government funded several national labs in the turn of the century to look into this problem and a lot of money was spent. The problem is that aluminum in itself oxidizes instantly in air and antimony reacts uh, to all sorts of crucibles. When you melt this and you try to form a crystal, it's going to incorporate a lot of defects and, and impurities in it as you're making it. So the traditional bulk methods, Chakrowski, Bridgman, traveling heated method, electrodynamic gradient technique, which are all used for like um, current state of the art detectors are hard to use in this particular case. So we use ultra high vacuum. These are called molecular beam epitaxy. We fondly call it the mega buck evaporator because it keeps eating up all our funding. Um, but uh, these are two reactors. We have a cluster of four and we grow under very low pressures, almost pressures you'd find several miles out into space. So no wrong atom gets incorporated into the crystal. It's just aluminum and it's antimony, no oxygen, none of the other impurities. The problem is that we only can produce ultra thin layers. So this is a wafer on which we've grown our material. We grow about five microns of this. We use very pure aluminum and very pure antimony, seven ends and six and fives but it produces very little material, uh, around 10 microns is the most that we can produce. Whereas uh, typical germanium detectors are inch by inch uh, in dimension or centimeters by centimeters in dimension. But we do have added benefits. Uh, we make use of, the, so this was a Nobel Prize award in the year 2000 to uh, uh, Herbert Cromer, uh, who's an amazing person from UCSB. And uh, we can stack different materials on top of each other in, in our form of epitaxy, which you can't in bulk growth. So we can put different layers. Now, why is that important? Because we can grow on several different materials. So here we are growing aluminum antimonide on a silicon substrate. This zipper-like interface is a patented technology that where we hold the patent, where we can make atoms skip um, uh, atoms periodically to manage strain so, so nothing starts to buckle or bend or crack. Um, so here's the final product. 
we've grown alumnum antimonide extremely pure uh, and we are able to totally isolate it from the wafer we grew it on. So this is five microns thick aluminum antimonide uh, that we've done. Uh, where is this useful? Where am I getting, taking you? Dosimetry. Or I, I, I thought non-proliferation issues were in the history. Apparently this week proves me wrong. It's, it's uh, well and alive. Uh, and the idea is that we would like to make little chips uh, that are self-powered either with a battery or with solar where you have traditional silicon circuitry side by side, you we grow our thin film aluminum antimonide on it. So as things are getting shipped, if it detects radiation, nuclear radiation anywhere, you immediately know that it's detected, it's sniffed out radiation. The other place where it could also be useful is you put it on uh, you know, components that go up in space. And the moment a certain amount of radiation is detected, you know that your electronics is compromised, that you might have to change it out. So active dosimetry is where we're going with this technology. It's a very niche market. Like I said, Adam and I have had several discussions on who to market this to. Uh, space and non-proliferation are pretty much the uh, main uh, areas we are looking at. There could be some safety applications for, uh, for certain people as well. Um, so, so those are our key market. Uh, that we're looking at. Um, so we keep pushing this technology. I think that um, we are still doing basic material work to keep improving this material. Very little is known about aluminum antimonide um, because of, of how volatile the material is. So, so we, we are having to do all the fundamental R&D to, to quantify all the parameters for it. But, but we are very happy with the progress we've made. I think we can make dosimetry devices right now if needed. Uh, and I think that's pretty much my presentation. So I'm happy to take questions. I hope I didn't run too long. That was great. Thank you, Gunny, very much for your presentation. Um, questions from our sharks. Matthias has his hand up first. So thank you very much uh, um, for this presentation. I have a question, radiation. What type of radiation can be detected? Is it X-ray? Is it, is it electrons, positrons, neutron beams? What type of radiation? Adam, you want to take that? Any ionizing radiation, if it's indirectly ionizing, you can put a converter in front. For example, a little bit of plastic, knock out some, uh, you know, something to knock out a layer let's say um, lithium, beryllium, to knock out uh, charged particles if neutrons interact, um, directly ionizing certainly very easily, um, photons. We made this to be a photon detector. Um, it is thin, so the cross-section is very low for, for photon detection, but it's telling you the radiation that, you know, in space, for example, the radiation that a ship beside it would be experiencing. So that's perfect. Hey, John. So can you go back to your customer discovery? Um, have you talked to anyone that would be a potential customer and what did they want from a device that you could potentially provide to them? I think that, I mean, yeah. So we, we did talk to, we indirectly had some customer exposure through Sandia because their LDRD was customer focused and uh, they were having they were looking at multiple uh, dosimetry type device materials and we were handling aluminum antimonide in that portfolio so we didn't get to directly talk to the customers but we sort of had an idea for what they were looking um, one of the key issues is is achieving a very low dark current so um, in, in traditional non-aluminum based semiconductors, uh, the impurities are not a problem. So you can get extremely pure crystals where if, if the room is dark and you're not experiencing radiation, you don't see any signal, which means the noise floor is nice and low. So when an event happens, you can detect it clearly above the noise floor. In aluminum antimonide, given how uh, how much impurities you have to deal with and, and um, just the parameters being unknown. When we fabricate it, our noise floor is a bit high at this point, which means that the ability to detect lower signals becomes an issue. 
This is something that can be resolved by R and D. I'm very confident of that because uh, in in most material systems, you have to do X hours of R and D by, and and typically these are done by much larger companies than than university researchers, and and that's sort of the gap between where our university R and D ends and and industrial manufacturing starts. Um, so, so that's kind of, I, I feel that's kind of where we are. We pushed it quite far along and there's some more things we want to do. We have some specific experiments we want to try. But I think that once it's, it's, it's done and once a product can be demonstrated, there will be quite active um, uh, interest in it from several. It, it may not even be as niche as I'm thinking. It, it might be very ubiquitous as like, like that's why I put the Stilt Watch sticker um, if, if you send a package through, so through a certain place and you want to make sure it's not exposed to radiation, um, that's one of the simplest ways of using this technology. Okay, we have some questions in the... Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Adam. I want to highlight that it, be, it can be grown on silicon as opposed to CZT, other detector materials, which have to be packaged separately in a vacuum container, wired out. Um, so this can be a very small form factor. Okay, thank you. Julia, do you have a question? Yes, thank you, Ganesh, for the presentation. Um, can you tell us a little bit about the next steps in development? Um, you said that eventually this will be a, a chip. You know, how far are you from, from getting there? And then if you can comment on, on the cost of production as well, what needs to be done so that it is attractive for your potential customers? I think that the next step is... is to me, so based on just anecdotal, you know, seeing materials go through their cycle, I would say that as a researcher at a university, if we can perfect um, the parameters, if we can get high resistivity, if we can get low background oxygen levels in the crystal, and, and if we can fabricate good laboratory-based uh, PN junctions that, that can detect, then I think that that technology is then at a point where an industrial partner can take it to the next stage and manufacture it. Now, I will say that, you know, anytime you add a 3.5 epitaxial process to a silicon CMOS process, it's not the simplest thing. Uh, you are adding a much more complex step. Uh, CMOS 3.5 integration hasn't been the easiest but there are ways to do it. And, and we run parallel to the silicon photonics industry, which is developing much of the standards and practices needed to manufacture these types of devices so we can piggyback on them. The, the, the cost is both the uh, industries that we, we are targeting, which would be non-proliferation and space, uh, allow us to have some flexibility in, in that cost. I, I, it, I would have to do a more thorough analysis on, on cost to tell you how much for instance, a, a $100 chips cost might go up if you integrate a dosimetry device on it. Um, I, that, that's something I don't want to say without, without uh, investigating a bit more, but I, I'll get back to you on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um...